Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, this is always an exciting time here at Geisley. Uh, we work all year round on a lot of new products and stuff, and we launch them at the SHOT Show. Um, if you've never been there, it's an industry only show, it's not open to the public, and there's about 70,000 to 80,000 people who go there. And the whole firearms industry, everybody brings out all their new stuff to launch it there. So it's a really exciting time. Um, Tonight, it's going to be hard for me to talk about everything and do it seamlessly. So you're going to see a lot of interaction from my teammates here in the background. You're going to see them throwing out comments and things like that. And that's because I got eight pages of stuff to go over, okay? And I don't know it all by heart, all right? So you're going to see me look at this. They're going to see them talking. Um, but I'll tell you, it is a momentous day here at Geisley. Um, you'll notice right here, I have hearing aids. And uh, Mrs. ALG finally convinced me to get hearing aids. Her and the kids were tired of bellowing, you know, and coming right up and shouting in my ear. And my hearing has been gone since I was 12 years old when I decided to shoot a cylinder of 357 mag from my dad's Ruger Blackhawk in a sand pit in New Jersey with the walls all around me. And after those six rounds, my hearing's never been the same. It's been gone. So I'm hearing things now that I haven't heard since I was 12 years old. So you might notice I'm talking differently because I'm talking softer, things like that. So it's a great day. And I didn't know the Amish even knew about hearing aids. I mean, what, they don't have things that make their hearing go bad, like loud machinery and guns and things like that. So it's pretty cool. All right, what we're gonna talk about first is A&M. We started a knife company about a year and a half ago, Abraham and Moses Survival Equipment. Where's the name come from? Abraham and Moses are my two boys. So I decided to comp combine them together. Abraham's 11, Moses is gonna be five in just a little bit, all right? So my son Abraham, he asked me to make a knife and I said, hey, why don't we just start a knife company and make knives on our own? So it's pretty cool. We got really cool equipment from Germany. You know, all this knife stuff comes from Germany, all the manufacturing equipment, um, you know, the grinders to put the, the, uh, the flats on the blade to sharpen it, you know, it's all robotic. Okay, we have a robotic sharpener. A robot grabs a knife, goes over to a sharpening belt, runs through the motions, goes over and polishes, it comes out razor sharp. And everyone gets read by a laser uh, measurement tool before it goes in so it's exact. But we got some really great stuff, all right? And we got some good stuff coming too. You know, we got a great serration machine coming here. Um, I don't know if you ever seen those World War I German bayonets with the saw teeth on top. You know, the ones that the that the, uh, the Brits and, and the French use an excuse that if a German soldier had it, they would shoot them on sight. All right, we're gonna do a cool survival knife with those serrations on top. So A&M is really cool, and we're finally getting things going to where we're gonna launch the knives. You're gonna see them in about a month, maybe six weeks or so, but we are there, all right? And we got four knives in A&M to start out with. They're all fixed plates. The folders are coming later. I got some new equipment that I have in storage for the folders, because they're gonna be really special. They're not going to be something that uh, you see out there normally. All right, it's going to be really cool. So the first bleed from a and from a and we, we're going to call it the number one, okay? All right, here it is right here. You'll notice the sheath, okay? Beautiful, gorgeous leather sheath right here. You'll notice the A&M logo, North Wales, PA, and Boston in the back. You'll notice the, the blade right here and the handles. Handles are G10. G10 is of Nolik. All right. Um, you might know it by my Carta. It, this G10 version is, is very um, resistant to water absorption and abrasion. It's extremely tough. And we machine this. You'll notice all the machining, uh, slate machining, um, I'm going to call it marks, but not really marks. It's a way that the end mill goes over this. It's all 3D machined if you can look at that. All right, you see that fits your hand really nice. So this is designed as a general hunting and survival knife. It's got a very nice blade here. That's approximately 200,000 stick. And this blade is made out of D2. D2 is a cold work type steel. Um, the cold the difference is in hot work, you're possibly forging something. 
all right, where the metal's red hot. In cold work, you're punching something like maybe punching something on a, on, a, on a press or something where you're punching holes in something. It's a cold work type steel and it's known for its abrasion resistance, its ability to hold an edge. It is very slightly corrosion resistant, but it's not a stainless steel. We keep this up about 58 Rockwell, which is right where you want, where it's gonna hold an edge, yet still, you're still gonna be able to sharpen it. But it's a very, it's a very good steel here, and this is the number one right here. Okay, I'll just go over to prices real quick. Um, it's going to be $299 with a Kydex sheath. It's going to be $269 for the knife alone and sheath here that you see here. That guy's $59. Bucks. And if you notice, we're going to have different kind of handles right here, different colors out of G10. Very cool. Okay, the next knife is the, is the number two. This is a really, really cool guy here. You'll see it has the same very beautiful... Um, hand work leather sheath here. You'll notice it has a, uh, a, a uh, parachute cord, 550 cord around the handle so you have double security here when you're carrying it so you know that if you're hunting this thing's not going to fall out you're going to lose it somewhere and spend the next two days looking for it. This guy here is designed as an all-purpose knife. Everything here we make in-house. You'll notice the hardware on this. That's 17.4 pH stainless steel. It's a Torx. You'll notice how custom it looks. That's because it's made right here on our Swiss screw machines. The blade right here is nano weapon finish. It's D2, same as the number one. Just fits beautifully in your hand. Very slim, very nice fixed blade. And this guy here, let me go over this. This is going to be 259 for the knife. Kydex sheet, 229 with the knife as it is, 50 bucks for the sheath. And we're going to have some different colors, OD green. A tan, very nice. This is number two. All right, number three. This is one of my favorites right here. You got fine, coarse okay. uh, handles there, too. You know, sometimes you just want to have a small fixed blade with you instead of a folder. This guy here, beautiful sheath. Just very nice how it fits your hand. This is the number three. Again, D2, nano weapon finish. All this hardware, all machined in-house, handles all machined in-house, and you have several different types of G10 here. This is a fine checkered finish, coarse checkered finish. This is the number three. All right. 219 with a Kydex sheath, 189 with the knife as it is, 49 bucks for the sheath, number three. Now we come to the PSD resistance, okay? The Goodman. My buddy Lou Goodman, retired out of Fort Bragg last year, he's a master knife maker. Um, if you go on YouTube, there's some really cool videos of him demonstrating this knife. It was a collaboration between him and Geisley. Uh, he is the real deal, Lou is, okay? He's, he is the guy, it's kind of like Elmer Keith, my favorite book, okay? Hell, I Was There by Elmer Keith, okay? It's kind of like Lou. He has been there and done that. And Lou is able to say, without a doubt, how a combat knife should be. He's able to do that because he's done it. And uh, this is it right here. You'll notice I pushed that button and out came Lou Goodman Special Operations Combat Knife. Right here, G10 handles. It's got a hilt. Got an area here on the Ricasso without any, uh, without any blades so you can use it for fine work. The steel. PD1 from Carpenter Steel in Reading, Pennsylvania, right down the road. Okay, when I chose PD1 for this, these guys came in here and we talked about the best knife, best best steel for a knife. What they had, I, I was uncomfortable with some of the stainless steels because with a combat knife, sometimes you got to use it as a tool and pry with it. And this is PD1 right here. That's what you're able to do with it, and you can. Joe, so you gonna cue that video up? Yep. All right, let's watch Lou here. Let's watch him bend this, okay? It's actually you bending it. It's me bending it? All right, look. 61 Rockwell. At 60 is where steel is brittle. This is 61, and watch what you can do with it. You'll notice the pipe get down to about 90 okay. degrees. Okay, all right. You can't bend it like this by hand. All right, like I'm scared, I'm puckering right there because I'm 
thinking, I mean, I'm putting so much force in this, something's going to cut loose. Okay, but look at that, 90 degrees on that. That's what you can do. If you put that knife in there and you hold it like this, let's say you're trying to pry something, you can't physically bend the knife by hand. You don't have enough force in your body to bend that. You have to put that pipe on it. You have to have a heavy workbench. You have to have a, a even, even the wood in there has to be correct. Okay, you put a piece of two by four and try to clamp it together. The wood splits, all right? Those are pieces of laminated maple in there, all right? That's what this is capable of. At 61 Rockwell, it's capable of bending like this. At any time when you need to use this to pry something, whether it's a glove compartment box or a file cabinet, here I'm thinking of things that Lou told me that, that they pry, okay, or something, you can use this guy for, all right? The sheath, the sheath of the future, right here, okay? It's not leather, not Kydex, it's machined, 7075 T6 aluminum. Here's the top of it, oops, and the bottom, okay? Here's the cover for the, for the knife sheath, machined out of this giant block of 7075 T6, and that's what you're left with, this featherweight, beautiful gem here. You can see all the, all the tool marks in there from how this thing is machined, this beautiful gem of a sheath. Here's the backing plate and how that works. And the key is, here it is, locked in place. You can have it on your gear, on your kit, ready to go. All you got to do is just press the button and out it comes. It can go in the other way too. And you can configure it so that it is a friction lock in and out. Or you can configure it with the lock. There you go. This is great. Lou Goodman, Special Operations Combat Knife. Okay. The price, it's $750 with the sheath of the future and a bunch of accessories in order to attach this to your kit. A belt loop kit that goes on the back, a kit for your kit for your gear, that includes everything. The knife as it, as it is, okay, with the Kydex sheath is $395. Joe, what is it without the sheath? It's three nine. It's three ninety five. Okay, we got three things here, but okay, three ninety five with a Kydex sheath. Very cool one. All right. So come and see. Come and see these knives. There's four of them. We're going to have a booth for ALG Defense and Abraham and Moses at the Shot Show. Come by and see that guy. All right, you'll like it. All right, we uh, um, let me, only only on the second page here. So we um, we made a rifle this year. We designed it. Designed it from the ground up, and internally it's called Joy. All right, it's JG06, JG, Joy Geisley. That's my little girl, okay, 06, because when we started the design, she was six years old. All right, so around here, we call it Joy. And this is it right here, okay? Everything on this guy was made here at Geisley. Okay, and this was designed for a specific military application. This rifle is in 260 Remington. It's our own suppressor on the end. It's a 22 inch barrel, okay, to get, squeeze as much velocity as, as you can out of a 6.5 millimeter projectile. One thing you'll notice, I can't, I'm not gonna take the suppressor off because there's some IP underneath and I can't show that, but I wanna explain something. The end of the barrel is right there, okay? You only have about a three inch long effective suppressor on this guy and it works extremely well. Very low signature. The gas system on this guy that we have works very good. It's an extremely accurate rifle. It's basically a half minute rifle. And I'm gonna say this, and, and here's how you gotta understand this. A lot of gas guns out there, they're not as reliable as people want, okay? And I wanted to make a rifle that a Somali pirate would be proud to raid a ship with, okay? Seriously. Okay, he's out there in the ocean, he's on his boat, he's got all kinds of salt spray and stuff like that. He has no facilities to maintain his rifle. His AKs are rusted to piss, okay? He still needs it to work when he goes up to this freighter and tries to raid it and steal it, right? Okay, that's what I wanted, all right? And it took a lot of work to do that. You'll see that it's a basic SR-25 type stoner rifle, okay, Air-10 version, all right? It's kind of the basic architecture. It's used because it works, it works well, all right? But there's things that you got to do in order to make a gun consistently accurate. And by that, I mean you have a gun, it's in a case, it spends weeks in there, and you pull it out, and you want your first shot to be where your second shot is. You don't want to have to warm this thing up, okay, and until you get good groups out of it. 
And with the way we design this, with the strengthening, strengthened upper receiver that we have, okay, this is very much a consistently consistent rifle. That's what we're after here. All right. One well, couple things you notice, here's the hardened cam race. This is what the cam pin bears against, nano weapon coated. Nano weapon is our own coating done in-house on our own machines. It is a family of coatings. It's not just one thing. It's extremely hard, 82 Rockwell. It is extremely lubricious. Okay, that is a word. Okay, we had somebody at SHOT Show come up last year, okay, and tell us that lubricious isn't really a word. It is, but I also, you know, um, can make up words if I want to. All right, Joe, what's the one I came up with the other, the other year? Stenacity. I'm trying to describe how the very thin grease of ALG stays in place. So it's tenacity, okay? You can do this, all right? We're, we're Americans and we, we do that kind of stuff, all right? But lubricious is really a word. So it's hard and lubricious. Inside the bolt carrier and bolt, their own, their own bolt, they're coated with nano weapon also. So what that means is the nano weapon is harder than sand. So when you get sand in your gun, it just crunches right through it, all right? That carbon from fouling does not stick. It's easy to come off. This is a very, very nice rifle. You will like this. This is the Gen 1, okay? We're working on Gen 2 here. Just some slight improvements that we wanted to do. This is a great gun, okay? You'll notice the, uh, the scope mount on this guy. I'll just talk a little bit about it. We are going to release this. This is our Vanguard mount. This is the Gen 2 one. You notice it has three attachment bolts. You'll notice how well this area here, that's for a, uh, a laser rangefinder, how well that hugs the scope. You'll notice the flying buttresses right here for strength and stiffness. So your electronic optic isn't flopping around when you shoot. You can't see it, but under high speed video, these things flop around and they lose zero. They damage the electronics inside it with this cantilever, it eliminates that, all right? Let's, let's take a look at this Vanguard mount. Joe, you want to grab me that? Yeah, sure. They're all kind of not attached. All right. Key things in this Vanguard mount. One is it uses our very strong, okay, cross bolt method of attachment right here. A, th a thousand to 1200 pounds of attachment force at each one. No lever mount's going to approach that. Lever mounts are in the range of 200 pounds, okay? That's all they got, all right? This thing, each one, 1,200 pounds on it. You'll also notice the machined in shear lugs, and each bolt is also a shear lug. Great. You'll also notice, and we've got my screws falling out, how we do this. Did you notice that? There's an internal cap. This isn't the cap. Other makers of scope mounts have this as the cap that you're trying to attach your cap to. This has an internal cap. Three screws on it, very broad for your heavier scopes as this is designed for. And this guy here fits over the cap. So you can remove this if you wanted to change out your laser range finder. And it also does not affect the zero of your scope. You also notice that it not only attaches here, but it also has these areas in the front where you have screws here. This is extremely stiff setup. Here's the part in the white, okay? This is our top diving board mount. You'll notice the intricate machining of this guy. One of the things we do here at Geisley is we try to buy the best equipment that we can. It gives us capabilities that we, that we could use our engineers and designers that they could do things that is more difficult for a traditional manufacturing shop to do. This is done on a five axis milling machine. What five axis means, and I'll, I'll go through, I'll show you what a three axis is. If you have your cutter, your cutter moves like this, it can move like this, combinations of that, and it can go up and down. On five axis, that cutter can now move. It can move like this, and on our machines, they're full five axis, so this can surface this. You can take a ball end mill and create beautiful surfacing on here. And you can see what this guy's made from. Again, a block of 7075T6. All of this material machined out to have this beautiful part right here where our engineers can use freely everything that they have to design the best possible component that they can.
Here's the base mount right here in the white. You can see how intricate this is. The two bores are line bores to, to each other, okay? So that everything is perfectly in line with each other. And again, this guy here machined out of a giant block of aluminum. At Geisley, we do things the hard way. We like to do it because it gives us the best stuff. And listen, as we're doing this, okay, this isn't, we're gonna have a question and answer session after this. Ask questions now, just, throw, just shout it out there. Um, if there's anything I can, I, can, I can answer, just feel free. Everybody right. wants to know when, when and where they can buy the rifle. Okay, we gotta get the Gen 2 going. And what that means is there's some, you know, just like everything, you know, design is an iterative solution, okay? And that, what that means is we're not like God where we speak things into existence. We design something and you change it in small increments, okay? And you use the basis of what other people have, have done before you. You know, Isaac Newton said, I stand on the shoulder of giants. And for that man who basically was one of the inventors of calculus, and if you're an engineer and you take five classes of calculus, you know how smart this guy is, for him to be humble enough to say, I stand on the shoulder of giants, that's what all engineers and designers do. So you use all the progress that people have used before you, all right, uh, for centuries, and you put your part into it. And then as you put your part into it, you make small changes in order to get yourself something that you think is right. And this guy needs some small changes. Just some small things, but we're working on it now. Um, we're gonna lower the weight a little bit. This guy with the, uh, with the optic, it's about 12 pounds, okay? So, you know, it's a 22 inch barrel, but we're gonna pull probably two pounds out of this guy and, uh, and lighten it up without sacrificing the, the accuracy or reliability. I mean, this gun was made in 60 days and that's no joke, okay? About 80% or so of the design was done. I had a roughed out bolt, a roughed out bolt carrier, and in 60 days we went to this. That's what we're capable here. So it'll be a little bit, all right? I'm gonna say summertime probably is when this thing's gonna be released. Okay. All right. If you're, if you're a dealer, a gun dealer, okay, and you're trying to talk to a customer about our triggers and stuff like that, um, some, you might have a gun with, with one of our triggers in it, but how do you describe to the customer what the triggers are? And what we've done is we're come, we came out with this year the standalone retail displays, all right? So you can take this, all right, and you can show your customers exactly what our triggers do and how they work. They have all kinds of, this is a single one, all right? For a trigger, you can have, this is an SSAE, and here you have all your different triggers in our airborne charge and handle. This is a great tool, all right, that's gonna be set up, all right, that you could use inside your shop, all right, to show your customers exactly what you have, and while you're not there, they can go over to the display and read about it. Joe, how's this work? How do you get these guys? Yeah, so the, the display itself is completely customizable. Um, you can pick whatever triggers you want. Um, we, can, we can swap any product for anything. There's different cards for every trigger. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's an ALG product or a Geisley product. Um, to get your hands on one, I would say email sales at geisley.com and uh, just reference the display or the need for the display. I know Diego, uh, what you guys see here is the tabletop models. Diego will probably queue up a video here in a minute for um, uh, a pegboard uh, model or a, a peg wall or a slat wall. And uh, we can hang it up. We can hang it up. Um, you can hang it up on your, on your display fixture or your gondola uh, in line as well. Um, but basically email sales at guysley.com. Reference uh, the fact that you, you know, you're a dealer and you're in need of a display. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the customer service team will put you in touch with an account manager. He'll reach out to you, and uh, he'll give you more details. Great. Uh, that's it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right. We got this little guy. This is something that we released, okay, a little bit ago, but I want to talk about it. This is the Maritime Bolt Catch. All right. You'll notice this guy right here. This has been very popular. All right. It's a great add-on to your AR. We call it maritime because it's easier to, to, to use with gloves, but basically it's a great full catch for a lefty. As you can see this, you can operate this thing with your, with your left hand and it, and it works really good. Um, it's a great upgrade here. It's got the checkering on here. This is beautifully uh, done checkering on this guy. Um, great tool. Check it out on our website. 
All right, we are coming out with a buffer tube here in our DDC. You know, when you when you do do a lot of guns or you Cerakote a gun and it's in tan, you know, you come to the buffer tube and if you put if you paint it, it gets scratched. It doesn't look right. It's black. It's with the rest of the gun. This is in our exclusive DDC Type 3 mil spec hard coat. This is not the Type 1 type anodized as you see out there. Sometimes it'll rub off. This is physically Type 3, which is an aluminum oxide, just like a grinding wheel that you see on like a, uh, uh, a buffer that you could sharpen like a lawnmower blade on or something like that. That's aluminum oxide, and that is grown on the outside of the surface. That's what it really is. So think of a grinding wheel and a thin film on the outside of the surface. It also penetrates somewhat inside. So this guy is, D is our DDC. It's going to come as a kit also with our Super 42. It's been just a wonderful thing that a lot of people love. It takes away the twang from your rifle, makes it much smoother shooting, works really good with some of your short barrel type guns. All right, so that buffer tube, which is 70, 75 T6, all right? It's not your uh, lighter, sh lower strength 6061, which a lot of them are made from, a lot of them come from China, all right? That guy here is the buffer 65 bucks, 75 for DDC, and the one with the Super 42 is $110. It'll also be available in a very, um, um, very cool color black. So to speak. So yeah, two color options. yeah, we're working. We're working on a on a very nice uh, anodized black. You know, a lot of black out there. You know, it's dull. Um, it's uh, blasted with aluminum oxide, which is a very very coarse grit. Hides a lot of imperfections, a lot of machining imperfections. Very popular in the gun industry. You don't have to worry about the nicks and the scratches and things like that um, on your on your parts as you machine them because they're hidden by this very sharp abrasive. But that's what gives you that very very dull black, and we're coming up with a black. It's absolutely beautiful. I, I think the word is is lustrous. It's not glossy. It doesn't reflect light, but it glows. I don't know how you could say that a black thing glows, but this is just beautiful. And you'll be seeing more of this black out. You'll be seeing more Geisley rails with that. Um, you'll be seeing the, this buffer tube with that. It's very, very cool. All right, here's a pretty good guy right here. This is the aim point pro mount right here. You'll see it, another five axis, beautiful piece right here machined. Uh, our cross bolt system, two shear lugs. You'll notice how the profile of this guy, what it looks like, here it is mounted up. Very, very cool. $140 in black. That's the compact four. Kevin's running to go grab the, uh, the one that's mounted up. Okay. Here's the Comp M4 mount. Again, machined out of a solid block of aluminum, 7075T6. Very high strength. This aluminum was developed by Sumitomo back before World War II for the Zero Fighter. That was the first thing that used this. This is a Japanese invention right here. Um, two cross bolts, two shear lugs. Okay, and this is what it looks like on the optic. Very cool, very, very, very secure. And that guy is $140 black too. Okay, we have a charging handle for and trigger. and trigger for the MCX. Here you go, this is a very popular SIG rifle. We have our super charging handle right here for this weapon. We also have a special trigger for it. These weapons run very quickly. The bolt speed is very high and are very hard on triggers. Okay, so we have a special one in here. It's completely different from the SSA. The SSA is its parent, but it's different. It has a bridge for the hammer to strike so the hammer doesn't come back and whack the trigger real hard. Um, char the uh, trigger is 325, charging handle is 119 for the SIG MCX. We'll jump right into the MPX, and you're going to get a lot of people. In. And I apologize, everybody. This is a de this is our R and D model, so it's a little bit beat up. Uh, but everybody's going to want to know about the status of the MPX trigger. Okay. Well, here is the charging handle. We have our version for this guy right here. Okay. You'll notice the cool gripping edges right here. This was taken from an M14 M1 Grand charging handle. It's a double curvature. Not only is it curved like this, but it's curved like that. Ergonomics from John Grand. 
all right? Instead of this, uh, like a round type piece that you're grabbing that's hard, all right? He used a lot of thought into this about how a charging handle should fit around the human hand. And what we've done is we put a tank tread on it for grip. It's not sharp. It just grips very, very securely, very securely. So this is for the MPX. All right, so where's our trigger for this guy? Um, <clears throat> It, it doesn't, our triggers that we have do not meet our expectations for use in the MPX. Um, we want a trigger that's basically going to be a lifetime trigger for the shooter. I, I really don't want to sell anything that has a lifespan that the shooter's ever going to see. All right. I want his grandchildren to wear the trigger out, not him. And, and our triggers, and just about every other trigger out there in this guy gets beat up. All right. So, we're working on something for it, but I'm not going to tell you that it's anywhere close, okay? So this is why we do not have an MPX trigger. If you put a Geisley trigger in this guy, all I can say is lube it up very well, but eventually you're going to wear it out, okay? That's just the way it is, the way how fast that gun operates. Bill, so, circle back to the uh, mounts. A couple people were asking, any plans for um, quick detach or something along those lines? You know, here's the problem with quick detach. They don't hold up, okay? Not my words, all right? Words of my customer. That's why there's a cross bolt on there for the people we designed our scope mounts for. They don't hold up, all right? And what that means is, is when you look at it in the nitty gritty, you do not get the, the return to zero. You get, you do not get the solid zero that our mounts provide, okay? And it comes down to clamping force on this guy. You can't have something with 150, 200, 250 pounds of clamping force, it's not enough to hold it in place. This is why our cross bolt system, with its over half a ton of force for each one, this is why it holds on there so well. And it's just, look, it's just, it's just physics, okay? You can't take a short little lever and rotate it around a, um, an axis. You, you can only put so much energy into the system through that short lever. You can't do it. Your lever isn't three feet long, okay? A bolt is an entirely different thing with the threads on there and how your force from your wrench is multiplied by the threads. You just can't put that much energy in into a short little lever. It's not there, all right? It's just not there. And, you know, we can take our bolt and I can show you, we, we have a, a system actually, I'm talking about all these numbers, we have a system to measure clamping force, if you believe that, all right? We've taken all kinds of mounts out there and we put them on there and we can take our bolt and I can tighten this thing up in my hand and I can get about 75% of what a lever mount does just by tightening up our nut with my fingers, all right? So until we get something, and I've actually made it, okay? It's got about 800 pounds of clamping force. We actually have it but it's, it's, it's a work in progress. All right, we've done it, and I know I just said that you can't do it, but we have a different way of doing it. All right, it's this involved type thing, but we actually have a quick detach that gets up to 800 pounds, but it is not ready for prime time. I don't know when it's gonna be. Look, if you're concerned about zero, if you're dirt shooting, it doesn't matter, okay? It, it doesn't matter. You can put anything on your gun, all right? I remember I used to shoot at a, uh, uh, range up in Jersey when I used to live in Jersey um, and used to shoot high power and next to it were the the ranges where everybody up next to the high power range is central Jersey um, there was a range where everybody would be shooting there and there were benches and things like that and they had a huge berm and while we would be shooting okay the next thing you know you'd hear and, and you know it's it's a Saturday or Sunday and there's a whole bunch of guys in the line there and uh, next thing you know people would be shooting and then all of a sudden the shooting would crescendo okay until everybody on every station was just blasting away and you know in jersey you can only have a 15 round mag and everybody with ars are just dumping rounds down range and we'd be like man what the heck is it world war three and kind of there were some ricochets coming over the berm between the thing coming over and we'd walk over and peek around the wall and i mean there'd be 40 guys just laying it down and i'm like man what's going on what kind of targets are they shooting at and then eventually it would die down and you'd look, there's no targets down there. It's just dirt, all right? That's all they're shooting at. They're shooting at a dirt berm. It's cool, man. I, I love it too, man. Dumping rounds and, and just, you know, building, building that up, I love it. You know, I started shooting, I'm not a competitive shooter. I shot a junk, okay? 
In New Jersey, people dump things, and there was a wonderful sand pit near where I lived where everything was dumped there, you name it, okay? Me, my pop, and my brother, we'd go out there on a Saturday morning, and in this sand pit, you'd find televisions, refrigerators, oxygen tanks, mason jars full of spoiled, um, like, uh, stuff from the farmers that they would just dump there that you could shoot at. And you find cars and trucks, okay? Stolen ones, dumped from Philly, all right? Usually when we got there, they were pretty shot up, all right? But, you know, they weren't there last weekend. And I remember one weekend we got there, me and my brother, and there was a pickup truck there, and it didn't have one bullet hole in it. And we had a long discussion about shooting that truck. And we decided as good boys, responsible that we were not going to shoot it okay this is where I this is where I came from so I know dirt shooting all right and then we came back the next week and the thing looked like Swiss cheese all right there was only one window left in a little side window that we blasted out all right but look if you're dirt shooting you don't need a good mount you can have something that moves around in your zero shifts if you're trying to hit that target at long ranges and you want the absolute best return to zero you got to have super precision and that's what we provide Okay. Kevin, how do you say it? Broger and Tome. Is that it? Broger and Tomet. I'm sorry. Speak up. Swiss. Okay. We got a trigger for this guy. I know people have put SSAs and other triggers in here and it works. Um, it's not really right. They have a little insert in here. If you pull the insert out, you can get an SSA to work. But that insert is so that the hammer, when it hits the plastic receiver, it doesn't damage it. With that insert in there, it needs a different hammer, okay? And there's different length of the pins on this guy, uh, much longer pins and how it all works. So what we did is we made a special trigger. It's based on our S3G type, okay? And it's very nice, okay? This is an S3G type trigger for this guy. Um, this is a very, very good nine millimeter. I mean, we've done, put a ton of rounds through it and this thing is dead knots reliable. Um, we've shot some other nine millimeters. There weren't so much at 400 rounds, a choke. This guy, you can keep right on shooting. Good Swiss quality right here. So we have a BNT trigger right here. Um, it's a special one. It's not gonna be made in mass quantities. Okay, where's my stuff here? All right, because of that, because of the lower quantities that we expect, this guy's $325, but it is a wonderful S3G type trigger. Comes with the correct pins for this, as you can see. It goes through special long pins, everything made right here for this guy. You'll see this at shot. And if you come to range day, if you come to range day, you'll get a chance to shoot it. Next, whatever, buddies. All gonna... right, SSP, Super Speed Precision. We started this two years ago. Okay, and it's been, a, it's been a journey. I just couldn't put something out there that wasn't 100%. That's not how we do things here. And I started this design in one way and I didn't kind of like it. So then I went whole hog the other way. And I spent a lot of money on tooling and other stuff. And what we would find is you'd have a wonderful trigger pull all right, we've got some of these things out to some guys who are professional shooters and they just rave about it, how fast it is, how beautiful it is. And I, I wanted a, a, a beautiful three pound Chris trigger like you have in a bolt gun. And what you'd find is the trigger pull would degrade after thousands and thousands of rounds, 5,000 rounds up to 10,000. It wasn't as good as what we wanted. I am sure that 99% of the shooters out there still would have felt that this trigger was good but that's not what we do. I, I just, I could not sell something like that. So, designing a trigger, all right, it's kind of like writing a song, okay? And what I mean, I'm not a musician at all, all right? But I've read how musicians develop things. Like there was a very cool article about a song by 10CC, all right? And if you're not my age, you don't know who 10CC is, okay? But from the 70s, all right, you might know the song, I'm Not In Love, okay? It's kind of like soft rock type thing, but I, there, was just, there was an article, the Wall Street Journal actually, about how these guys wrote the song. And you know, basically this guy was being hassled by his wife because 
he wasn't saying I love you to her enough. And he's like, well, I'm going to write a song about I'm not in love. How's that sound? All right. And then as they got into this and they, and they started as they developed this thing, you know, there's all kinds of things that come in from it. And a lot of people had different inputs into things. And that's kind of what designing something's like. For instance, they wanted one portion in a song where they had a female voice. And there are four guys, and they're like, well, who the heck are we gonna, gonna use for a female voice? Well, hey, I know this girl singer, and you know, I'm like, man, we're at the studio. What are we gonna do? And they're like, wait, I forget the girl's name. I'm gonna call her Susie Q. She was a receptionist. And they're like, get Susie Q in here. We'll get her. Well, this girl's not a musician. She's not a singer. Here she is, is this English girl. And they say, okay, okay, here's what you gotta say. And I forgot what it was. You got, just gotta, you gotta say it in the mic. And they're coaching her and trying to do this trying to do this and Susie Q she's like man that is the dumbest thing you got me you want me to do I'm not gonna say that I'm gonna say big big boys don't cry and that was her input in this thing if you listen to the song you hear her with her English accent in the background saying big boys don't cry and she put something into this all right from herself and that's what designing something's like I I cannot say that I am this much a Geisley I'm this much the rest of it are my teammates here. There's no employees here at Geisley. There's no associates, all right? There's only teammates, that's what we are. And I love seeing the input of my teammates into a design. And that's what came up with this SSP. I kind of showed my teammates who hadn't worked on this thing for almost two years, what we had done in the beginning, and they took it and ran with it and worked that design out themselves, all right? without any input from me. And what we have here is here it is. Three, three and a half pounds. It's a single stage and it's nice, okay? It's not like some of these garbage cartridge triggers out there, which are a joke, all right? What this thing has, it has a full power hammer spring, all right? All these cartridge triggers out there that everybody buys and thinks it's wonderful and easy to put in. They got a compromised hammer spring. A compromise, ha compromise hammer spring increases your lock time and lowers the consistency of your niche and of your primer. This is a proven thing. It's proven by the Army Marksmanship Unit. First words out of their mouth from their head gunsmith when I showed him my trigger at Camp Perry in their tractor trailer was one hammer spring does your high speed trigger use. First words out of his mouth. And I explained, well, it's my own, but basically it has the same torque as an M16A1. He's like, right on. He's like, we won't use anything with any soft hammer spring. And then he explained to me all the data that they found from it, okay? So when you take some of these other triggers out there and you put them in your rifle, you're making your rifle less accurate. You're making it less reliable, okay? Why would you do that? You wouldn't take your, you wouldn't take your barrel and like smash it against concrete to beat up the crown, okay? But that's what happens, okay? Full power hammer spring in this guy and it's just absolutely gorgeous. You're gonna love it, okay? You're gonna love this thing. And we're getting there with production, okay? We're, we're moving on it. It will be available at Brownells first, okay? Go to Brownells. They will have this for approximately a week to 15 or so days, I think, first. So when you want to look out for this guy, go to Brownells. You'll see it, SSP, super speed, precision, open architecture, so dirt from your suppressor and things like that. You can clean out, and it doesn't jam the trigger up full power hammer spring, everything you want in a single stage trigger, finally, SSP. All right. This is my PCD resistance, or I shouldn't say mine, but my teammates. Okay, <clears throat> when I was a young guy, if you can believe it, I used to race flat track motorcycle. Yep, I did. I was an amateur, and uh, that's what I used to do. My only thought when I was a young guy, the only thing I really cared about were two things, girls and how to make my motorcycle go faster. That was it. This was my, that, was, that was my life, all right? And uh, I had some good guys that I hung out with that I used to race with. And uh, one fellow especially, he was uh, a machinist back then. Now, I, was, I worked in machine shops, but I wasn't like this guy. Um, he was top-notch. He had undergone an apprenticeship at a shop that made a lot of parts for IBM. Um, he had won a machinist competition for young people um, where he traveled around the country and went to this machine competition, basically kicked everybody's butt. 
all right and he was his bike always had the trickiest most beautiful machine components titanium axles all kinds of stuff and when i went to visit his shop one day in ivy land pa i was just blown away by the machines there you got to remember my motorcycle days were spent working at a chopper shop all right nick's custom in williamstown new jersey and nick's was a chopper shop and if you know anything about nick he was on american pickers at one time he has just about every harley davis you could ever imagine early ones everything you want he used to work at al's choppers in new jersey on the black horse pike and back in the day all the harleys they used to they used to take all the parts off it and turn them into choppers and what did they do with the old parts well al used to throw them in barrels okay and he had all these mean dogs to protect the place and they used to take all the dog crap and shovel it on top of the parts and Nick used to go and dig through all the dog crap and all the parts and take all these parts and bring them home to his mom's chicken coop in Williamstown. And after working at Al's Choppers for a while, he started his own chopper business and things were great. And then sometime in the late 70s, he started getting phone calls. Hey, I need a fender for, you know, my knucklehead, you know, my 47 knucklehead. You think you got one? Nick's like, yeah, I got one. Hey, I need this. And he had all these parts in his chicken coop. Lo and behold, all these parts that now everybody wanted. Okay, so this is how I grew up. And, you know, Nick had some old machines there, and it was you make it work the way you can. But my buddy, his name's Dave, he worked at a different shop, a different level. And lo and behold, about a year ago, Dave is introduced to me again. This is 30 years, okay? I hadn't talked to him in 30 years. And... He, he winds up, he lives close to our shop here in North Wales, PA, and he came to work for us. And Dave is a wonderful engineer and a master machinist. And there's a lot of Dave in this trigger right here, okay? This is our Super 700 bolt gun trigger, finally, okay? Finally, all right? I made a bolt gun trigger about three years ago. I didn't care for it. It wasn't up to snuff. It wasn't safe enough. And Dave and I sat down, and we hashed this trigger out. First came to Mark 13, which we did for Crane. This whole thing got kicked. Crane kicked us in the ass, all right? Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center, because they're like, listen, we got a bunch of Mark 13 here, and the triggers that are in them are junk, and we need something that works. Can you, can you do something for us? We rocked with it, all right? We came up with the Mark 13. You don't see it. It's not for sale, basically, for civilians, only because of how special it is. It only fits distiller actions in the AI stock of what the Navy Mark 13 sniper rifle is, okay? It won't fit a Remington 700, but this trigger is two-stage, non-adjustable. It is the only trigger that has ever passed the U.S. Navy drop test with the safety off, okay? They do the drop test with safety on because, and I ask, well, why? What's, what's the reason of that? And they're like, well, no trigger, any decent trigger, bolt gun trigger won't pass with the safety off. You're not going to drop it from five feet onto a one-inch thick steel plate that represents the deck of a ship. It's going to go off. Ours passes with the safety off. All right. It's awesome. They love it. All right. We're running these things out here. Okay. These Mark 13 triggers. But they're not something that will work with a regular Remington 700. And the reason why is the way Stiller makes their actions. All right. And I never met these Stiller dudes. They're from Texas. The well for the trigger is machined in with an end mill, all right? So it's a flat slot like this. The way Remington does it, they do it with a big round cutter, a Woodruff key cutter per se. And this cutter goes in and it leaves a circular dome where the trigger, where the trigger sits. So our Mark 13 trigger that we designed for the Stiller will not fit a regular Remington 700, all right? These Stiller guys, you know, we have their actions here. Like I said, I never met them, but they're top-notch machinists. They do a good job, all right? I love these stiller actions. They are built solid. Um, they, do a, they do a great job on these things. Um, so the 700 is the basis of it is the Mark 13, all right? But it's not the Mark 13. It will drop in. Our goal is to drop in to any Remington 700 that's out there, whether you got one with a wood stock from 1972 or you got one of their latest ones. It's designed to drop in. What are the things we wanted to see out there? There's all kinds of aftermarket triggers for the, for the Remington 700. They all have their issues as far as I'm concerned, all right? 
Some of them, the, the field just isn't there. Other ones take a ton to set up, all right? I got one in a hunting rifle that took me like an entire day to screw around with to take this thing apart, stone all the parts, clean it, mess with it, adjust it, finally get it right, all right? I went to Africa on a safari here last year, and here I got my gun out, and I'm gonna take it, and the trigger doesn't work, all right? So instead of risking it, I went and bought another gun, all right, that was, well, let's just say it was a five minute gun from the factory, um, which wasn't very cool. But I managed to take a bunch of animals with it. But my trigger in my hunting gun, my 308, had failed. So what we wanted was a trigger that had superior feel, that handled dirt ingress, and how these guns are where people don't take them out of the receiver too much. And we wanted it to be extremely safe. Um, You've seen some exposés on 60 Minutes and on TV of triggers out there and their safety issues of people getting killed and wild things where like the trigger is, is, uh, is on and they take the safety off, the gun goes off. Well, the reality of it is there are triggers out there uh, for bolt action rifles that will do that, okay? You can put the safety on and you can take the safety off and the gun will go bang. Talk to a firearms trainer, all right? I was talking to a government uh, firearms trainer the other day. He does a lot of work with local police up here near New York City. All right, he says, yep. He says, every time I get SWAT teams in there and we train snipers, there is at least one ND on bolt gun during the setup. He's like, it always happens. All right, you know, my sniper buddies, when I ask them, hey, do you use the safety? They're like, man, the old guys back in the day, we never touch the safety. They're like, they taught us that the bolts are safety. This thing was up. All right, they didn't touch their safety. And I wanted a safety that could make it as safe as we possibly could, all right? And this is the guy right here. This is it, all right? Super 700, okay? The housing is beautifully machined out of an aluminum copper alloy, all right? Why do we use this alloy? One, it's very strong. The other thing is it's very stable because of the intricate machining in here. We wanted you need to be able to machine what you're doing and get the intricacies from this. And that's what we did. It's got a beautiful safety on this. The safety is triple redundant. It blocks the trigger. It blocks the internal parts and it blocks the transfer bar at the same time. Triple redundant safety. We did our best to make this guy as safe as possible. The other thing that this guy has is you look at that bow. Kind of odd looking, don't you think? Here, let me put this up so you can see it. That wasn't me. Again, that was my teammates. All right, I was comfortable with the bow that was on there, and my teammates said, "You know what? I don't like it." They're like, "The edge of my the edge of my trigger finger rubs on the stock. It's got to be different." And through an iterative process, this bow came as soon as you put your finger on it. It's pure sex. What it is. All right, your finger doesn't ride on the stock. It is just absolutely beautiful, and this trigger is convertible from single stage to two stage, all right? There's not a lot of two stage triggers out there. And the ones that are out there, they're not a real two stage, they're a pseudo two stage. What you're doing when you pull it is you're just working against a spring. You have the same amount of sear engagement riding on a hair as a single stage trigger. They're no different. It just gives you a feel that you have a two stage trigger. This isn't like that. This is like our SSA trigger. Our SSA trigger has a large sear engagement, that you remove the, mo the vast majority of that when you pull through the first stage. This is a very safe and reliable, robust trigger. But as a two stage, you get performance out of it. And that's what you get. You get a trigger that we're gonna sell two ways. It's gonna be a two stage or single stage, but each one can be converted back with the adjustment screws into anything you want. We're just selling it that way because the guy who knows he wants a single stage he might not want to take his two stage and adjust it and go through the adjustment procedures. He just wants to drop it in. All right, the guy who knows, knows he wants a two stage, he's going to start out with that. They're the identical trigger, just set up differently. Okay, Dave, what's this guy? This is, okay, single stage right here. This guy is two and a half pounds. That's how it's going to be set. No creep, just a beautiful, snap when you want your bullet to move out of there. It's absolutely gorgeous. Adjustments for over travel, adjustments for weight, 
adjustments for the serious engagement. It's all there. It's all done from outside of the gun. You know, taking this guy apart. All right. Um, it'll go down to fairly low weights. It'll go sub under a pound. It won't go down any of your two ounce weights or anything like that. Like bench rest shooters like with, you know, they don't use a safety on their guns. But this is going to be a beautiful single stage right out of the bat. If you're a tactical shooter, you just crank up on one screw, bring it up to three and a half pounds, and this is a beautiful trigger for a police officer, okay, or for someone in the military who wants a single stage trigger. All right. Absolutely gorgeous. We moved to the two stage trigger. I'm a two stage trigger fan. It's got everything I want. All right. I love it. And here it is. You're beautiful. You're beautiful, absolutely smooth first stage. And you just come up, and this guy's set at about eight ounces. So the reality of it is you have an eight ounce trigger. All right, even though it's two and a half pounds, it's eight ounces. And you think about that. What could you do with an eight ounce trigger as a, as a hunter or something? You don't want to be out in the field running around with that thing, okay? You know, there was a time at one time, I remember I was out hunting with my brother-in-law up in Sullivan, Sullivan County. And, you know, we'd been out there, it was opening day, and uh, we all went out to our certain spots and we sat, and it's just gorgeous, gorgeous country out there. And um, one of the guys in the club, he shot a deer, and as, as the light came up, he started dragging it, and I saw him, and I, you know, grabbed my gun, unloaded it, okay, went over to help him drag it. And my brother-in-law came up, and he, he had a Marlin 336. He opens up his lever, um, and we start helping to drag it. We had to drag it up this steep bank, fairly, fa fairly long and very narrow, all right? And here I am. They're dragging the antlers. I'm trying to pull on the back, you know, help, help it up the back. And it's a mess. We're slipping and sliding, snow and things like that. But while we're going up there, the one fellow who had shot the deer, here he is. He's trying to get this thing up, and his muzzle's like this on my face, okay? I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, all right. I say, hey guys, how about this? How about I get your guns? Let me carry them, you drag it with the horns, I'll grab the guns, all right? My brother-in-law gives me his, this fella gives me his, okay? And what's in there? A nice 306 round in the chamber unfired. He already got his deer, but he has a gun, all right? And this thing is looking at me, okay? Two-stage trigger gives you the overlap that you need to have absolute safety in situations like this. Yeah, he had his safety on, all right? But it gives you everything. Reliability, performance, forgiveness. It has everything you need, a two-stage trigger. And you'll find this Super 700. It's gonna be at Brownells, first day. Again, they're gonna have the first ones. Uh, $250 for this guy. Um, you will absolutely love this trigger. Anything you wanna add, Joe? No, that's pretty much it. You covered all of it on that one. Okay, if you have any questions, fire away. And it's going to be available probably around March, March is 1st of April. <clears throat> Grab that up. Yep. So, you know, the U.S. military has been using the M4 carving for quite some time, and there's been, you know, um, improvements all along. You might have seen or heard of the SOP mod program where they modify their M4 carbines, you know, special operations guy, uh, guys, they, they modify their, their carbines with different things. This is where the ACOD came from. They were the first ones with it while everybody else is shooting M16s with iron sights. All right, and things move from SOCOM to Big Army generally, all right, but SOCOM's usually the first with it. And uh, the guys at at uh, at uh, USASOC, they use our SSF triggers in their guns. If you see the guys out there, the Green Berets, the guys the SSF in their gun. All right, we've seen our products two times on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. All right, it gives me a lot of pride to see that and how my teammates here are are using their efforts, you know, to support our war fighters. Well, earlier this year, the U.S. Army Special Operations. They wanted to see if they could improve their M4 carbines even more than what they are. So they embarked on a project to make an improved upper receiver group. Now you might have seen something about a month or two ago where big army acquisition, it might have even been, been the Secretary of Defense, he instructed the procurement of the U.S. Army to be more like SOCOM, that's what he said. All right, instead of these big, huge projects where they go through and, 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 they, and they spend years and years and years testing things to add infinitum, 
It's basically get the users, get an evaluation, and buy it, okay? Try and buy very quickly. And that's what the special operations guy did who were responsible for this. And um, they chose our rail and they chose our charging handle. And you might know this as, as SOTMOD Block 3. They're not calling it that, all right? Even though that's reality what it is. It is the URGI, Upper Receiver Group Improved. Okay, this is what the Green Berets are going to be carrying. And it's this guy right here. All right, this is it. All right, this is our Mark 16 rail. We have 16 totally different types of rails out here now. Um, starting from the Mark 1 that, what, that came from our HK416 rail, it has, uh, you know, steel inserts um, to hold the accessory rails on, up to our Mark 2 that uses these uh, very thin plate nuts behind it, up to our very popular Mark 4, Mark 8, up all the way to the 16. And the 16 was designed exclusively for use of soccer. It was designed exclusively for them with their input, what they wanted to see in their improved upper receiver group. You're not going to be able to buy this rail as it sits. It is only going to come with an upper that we're going to sell. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, the upper receiver right here, this upper receiver is a standard M4 carbine upper receiver. The bolt and bolt carrier are standard M4 carbine mil spec bolt and bolt carrier on this guy. All right. The charging handle, you'll notice there's no laser marking at all. This is our ACH airborne charging handle. You'll notice that it is roll marked right here, very small text. Guys, the automatics. All right, this is at the request. They do not want bright white laser marking on their products. You'll notice that. No laser marking made especially for them. The Mark 16 rail, 13 and a half inches long. M lock attachment points, yep. U.S. Army, they're using M-Lock on all of the quadrants, even on the 45s. The profile, slim, but not too slim. Fits your hand beautifully. A couple people want to know what the difference between the 16 and the uh, 14 are, the Mark 16 and the Mark 14. They vary. The, 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 the difference is, is being able to get your M-Lock here on these quadrants. That's what's important. Okay, that's what they wanted. And you can't really do that with, with the 13 and 14. They're thin. They're actually thinner than this. All right. They have, that is our slim line rail, the 13 and 14. It's very close. If you have it, you're going to be very close to it. Um, what this guy here is its own profile. Non-rotating QD inserts right here. Extremely flat, flat Picatinny across the top. You'll notice no laser markings. The markings are engraved. All right. You'll also notice that there's no laser markings on the outside right here. You'll see a small guys, the automatics. This is in a dull laser. This is one of our earlier Mark 16s. It will be impressed into the Mark 16s for, the, for, for our contracts. You'll notice the screws, oddball type things here, entirely made in house. These aren't, you know, these aren't socket head cap screws that you buy from a hardware store. These guys are 17-4 pH precipitating hardening stainless steel that's also been nitrided Torx number 30 attachment that's what they wanted all right these are beautifully works of art they're also captive they don't fall out when you loosen them they pull out and they stay there and then you can push them back in they're captive screws so the soldier won't lose it they also asked for dual anti-rotation lugs you'll notice it up here on the top and on the bottom we have our bulletproof type small set screws that go into, that touch up against the side. The barrel nut has one groove. You'll notice the crankshaft bolts right here. We have found that a crankshaft bolt gives you slightly better stiffness. This has our barrel nut that is two and a half inches long. It's long, it's extremely stiff, extremely rigid. They put this thing through the ringer. You'll notice that it comes out very close to the end of a 14 and a half inch long, long barrel. Um, we are going to be selling this upper, okay? It's going to have a mil spec upper receiver, a mil spec carpenter 158 bolt, this charging handle, the Mark 16 rail. It's also going to have a pinned and welded Surefire open time um, 
flash hider. We'll pin and weld it so you'll have a 14 and a half inch barrel ready to rock, all right? The barrel is from Daniel Defense, all right? Daniel Defense won the barrel portion of it. You know these guys, they make an extremely high quality hammer forged barrel with their own special steel. And it has been found by the special operations guys that this provides an increase over the standard M4 carbine barrel that's out there and it's extremely accurate, long lasting chrome line, top notch stuff from Daniel Defense. That's what's gonna be on this guy. Okay, we also are gonna be selling one without a charging handle and without a, uh, a bolt carrier and without a muzzle device. So you can attach your own if you want to. All right, let me get your prices here. Uh, the, the URGI complete 1379, no bolt carrier, no charging handle, no muzzle device, 979, available Brownells first, okay? You know Brownells, you know that they got just about everything that you're gonna need when it comes gun-wise, whether you're looking for cleaning patches or whether you're looking for a URGI, USGI mil spec upper receiver, they got it. They're gonna have it first. And we're gonna estimate it's gonna be approximately march -ish before you'll see this guy. Gas system. Gas is mid-length, mid-length gas system. There it is, all right, how long have we been waiting for that? All right, it's a mid-length gas system. The gas block on this is our uh, super gas block, but we made a new version. We're gonna call it the compact gas block. Um, our regular gas block comes kind of close to the edges of the rail, doesn't hit it, but we decided to make a slimmed down version. Still stainless steel for erosion resistance. Okay, and corrosion resistance, 17-4 pH. That's what this guy is, it's just slightly smaller. If you held both of them in your hands, you almost couldn't tell the difference between it, but we made a new one to fit a little bit better in here. People wanna know if that's gonna be a limited thing or are we gonna be producing it? No, we're, we're, we're gonna produce it. Um, the gas block? The, well, and the uppers. No, you're gonna be able to get them as much as you want. All right, that's our goal. All right, we got, you know, we're making a bunch of these guys. So we got our machines buzzing out here and you're gonna be able to get it. All right, that's it for hardware. Let's talk about SHOT Show. You know, I know a lot of you, you're not able to go. You're not in industry. You wanna, uh, you know, I, I wish you could go there and see it. And you know, me and, and, and Mrs. ALG, you know, we're not partiers or anything like that. We don't go to, to Las Vegas to like, go out at night, that's not what we do. When we go out at night, we're taking our customers out to a nice dinner, all right? Um, and we wanna put our feet up, all right? We are there for the show and for our customers, and we just wanna make it a great experience for everybody. We love, we, we just love doing things with our customers and having a good time. We have a good time at the show. So we put on a big production, all right? We love doing it, all right? So I'll just talk about it. There's something called Range Day, that's on Monday. It's for press, Joe, press and dealers, the range day. Press dealers, uh, all sorts of industry people, yeah. you gotta register. Industry you people, you gotta register, you've got your badges already. All right, everybody at range day who comes out, they'll get a chance to shoot the Super 700, the SSP, the b and trigger, see all the cool stuff and shoot it, and everybody gets this cool shirt. All right, Las Vegas, every year we make it, here's the shirt that we're gonna be giving out at range day. Okay, so if you come to range day, come to our booth. All right, at the booth itself, there's all kinds of free giveaway stuff. Forgotten Country stickers. Awesome luggage tags, okay? They're free, all right? So you can tag up your luggage. Sample packs of ALG Defense, Go Juice, and Very Thin Grease. They're free. Grab these things, put them in a range bag. Again, come to our booth. Every year, we also have a badge ID holders. You know, some of these things you get there, they're cheesy, they fall apart. These guys are free. We actually have an engineering drawing for this thing, if you could believe it, all right? In here, you can put your, uh, your ID. There's another pocket here for other things like business cards from people. And in the back, you have your business card pocket and a pocket for a pen. These are free. We give them away at, at our booth. Come on by and get them. The other thing we have is we give away these VIP tickets, all right? 
and you get a deal with these things, okay? With this ticket, you get a code and you can go on our website and you can get 30% off all things on Geisley, on the Geisley website, plus 35% off SSA and SSA e-triggers. All right, one, one use only, Joe? Single use only. All right, how long does it go for after the show? Two weeks after the show ends. Two weeks after the show ends, that's what it's good for, okay? But you can take this guy, all right, and uh, that night when you get up to your hotel room, you get a great discount on Gaji stuff. And these are free, and you can grab a bunch of them. It's not like we hand you one and that's it. You'll also notice that it has a tear-off portion. And uh, this is for a big production that we do. We have a Plinko board. You know Plinko where you drop the, the puck and it goes down, and it comes down to... Uh, um, something where you win something. We did this last year. It's actually Joe's idea to do it. All right. The year before that, we had a cash booth where cash flew and you had fake cash that had like a trigger or rail on it and people were grabbing it. Splinko board is way better. All right. So we give away a ton of stuff. Every day, there's two drawings, one at 10 and one at 3 o'clock. Okay. 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. 11 and 3. 11 and 3. 11 and 3. All right. You come and grab your VIP ticket. You pull this off, you put it in the bucket. At 11 o'clock, we have a drawing. How many winners show? Three winners each drawing. Three winners each drawing. Six winners total per day. Six winners per day. And what you win down on the Plinko board, you can win a trigger, you can win a rail, you can win a Goodman Special Operations Combat Knife, 750 bucks. All right, what else is there? Guys, the rifle. All right, there you go. Right there, can you zoom in on that? Look at the serial number. Shot with a serial number after it, shot 18. This is a Geisley rifle. This is entirely DDC, Desert Dirt Color, Type 3, anodized hard coat, no Cerakote, no painting. This is a Geisley rifle, tricked out with all kinds of Geisley stuff. SSA trigger, our own Safety, posi lock safety. It snaps. It doesn't stay in between. It snaps in place. We're gonna be coming out with a lower parts kit. Guys, a lower parts kit soon. We have all the parts, except we gotta get in production on the mag catch, which is gonna be stainless steel, okay? Everything on this guy, you'll notice it has our DDC buffer tube right here, Super 42 spring and it has a Mark 16 rail and a pin and welded Surefire flash suppressor. All right, look at that cool Comp M4 mount. I mean, that thing is righteous, okay? We're giving away two of these guns every day. Every time we run the Plinko board, there is gonna be a gun there. If somebody doesn't win the gun, the gun goes to the next one. And some days we have two guns up there on this Plinko board. So all you got to do is stop by our booth, pick up a VIP, tic VIP ticket, tear it off, throw it in it. You have to be there to win. Okay, we're going to call out the numbers. All right, as loud as we can. And I'm going to wait for that person to shout out. And if that, we give it a time frame. The clock start ticking when I shout it out. What is it, Joe? What do we usually use? 20 seconds? About that, yep. 20 seconds. All right, so... If you're hard of hearing like me, man, you better get hearing aids and hear your number, all right? Because after 20 seconds, it gets tossed and we pick another one, all right? And you can win this guy. Okay, how many total are we going to have? Ten? Eight. Eight, so eight total one, for... One, one, uh, two for each day, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then... Uh... Okay, now I'll get into the other things. we got eight of these guys. That's what we're giving away. Remember, if you're in a band state, you're not going to get the lower. Okay, so how do you, you know, look, I'm not in industry, I'm not in Las Vegas, man, I want to get involved with that. Well, look, our, my great media crew is going to be out there, and on Friday, on January 19th, okay, we're going to have a post to general discussion, that's before SHOT Show, right? Correct, you want to give them the rundown? You come on over, Joe will do this, he's, he's got this all dialed in. Yeah, this, so, is, this is for everybody non-industry who's on Air 15. So for those of you who can't make it, uh, Friday, prior to uh, uh, the week of SHOT Show, I believe it's January 19th, we'll be placing a post in uh, general discussion in ARFCOM. Um, users can respond to that post 
up to two times a day with either I want super precision or Geisley all the things. Hashtag before. Yep. Um, what will end up happening is all the way up until the following Friday, pr- approximately around 3.45 p.m. Pacific Standard, um, we will then have a representative from ARFCOM at our booth, and we will live stream a drawing, and we will, we will pull 10 winners. Uh, so basically what we will do is use a random number generator. Uh, we'll call out the page number, and then we will do another random number generator to pull out, call out the post number. Uh, that person will win. And then um, the, uh, uh, the, the representative from, AR, uh, from ARFCOM will be your... You okay, Diego? Good to go? Yeah, yeah we're good, we're good. The representative from ARFCOM will, uh, will, will be you, and uh, he will instruct the girls to drop the Plinko puck on your behalf, and whatever they win, you win. Uh, now, what happens if after the 10 winners, we don't have, you know, we don't have any winners for the guns? Uh, we're going to give two guns away in that. Um, we're going to keep pulling names until somebody wins a gun. So if it takes us 10 more to win a gun, it takes us 10 more to win the guns. So we'll keep doing the drawing until the two guns are won by somebody. And that's it. That's how all it right. works. It's going to be great, man. Um, so you can participate, all right? You're going to be able to participate on this. And, Joe, they don't have to be there. They can. They, we're going to PM this info, right? Yep. You don't. You don't have to be present. Everything will be live streamed. Um, you know. But you don't will, have to be on the live stream to win. Correct. We'll 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 uh, we'll, we'll PM the winners uh, after the fact and get all your information. Again, if you're in a banned state or a restricted state, uh, the configuration of what you will receive will be different. It'll either be just the upper, or in some cases, it might be only some parts of the upper, considering uh, about the whole flash hider and all that other kind. Of, it's a whole other world of stuff that we'll get into. Um, but yeah, that's how uh, that's how it'll run. You don't have to be present, but uh, be active on ARFCOM. It's it's done only through ARFCOM. Uh, there is no Facebook entry, YouTube entry, Instagram entry, none of that. It is 100% done on uh, on AR15.com. Great, wonderful. Okay. Um, I want to take this moment. We're at the end here, and um, I want to ask everybody what kind of products they would want to see from guys in the future. You know, when we get home from SHOT Show, um, we're pretty whipped. But when Monday, Monday morning comes along, I tell all my teammates, SHOT Show's here. Get ready for the next SHOT Show, okay? What kind of stuff would you want to see? Would you want to see maybe a bolt gun, a Geisley bolt gun, all manufactured in-house here in North Wales, Pennsylvania? How about an improved 1911? Okay, I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of 45s. They're great weapons. They got some idiosyncrasies. Um, reliability issues, things like that. Would you want to see us work on that? We have 11 engineers here at Geisley, and they outrun our production floor and our R&D floor. In other words, they can design things at a way faster pace than we can make it. And a lot of times my job here is, um, you know, not so much running the business and not even so much looking after engineering because if we have an engineering office, my office is right next to it, okay? My door's right there, all right? I don't have an office up front in the corner uh, because I fulfill all the engineering roles. My office is in the back full of all kinds of gun stuff. And if any of you guys have been in my office, you know how cool it is. Um, but what kind of things might you want to see from guys in the future? You know, we've got some great ideas for bolt guns. We've got some improved 1911 type things. And I'll tell you, a lot of my times, you know, it's spent increasing our capabilities. You know, I'm all about having the best equipment so that we can do things like that Vanguard mount, cool things that are difficult to do. And um, actually, last week, I bought a Williman. All right? I bought a Williman. And if you're a machinist, you may have heard of these machines. They're made in Switzerland. They're very much used in the medical device industry, all right, where a lot of implants and things like that are done on these machines. It's an extremely accurate and capable bar-fed five-axis milling machine, and I bought one. And, uh, you know, when, it, when it's come time to get this guy set up, you know, the Swiss are a little funny with their stuff. Um, you know, there's a bunch of machine tools out there that are made in Switzerland. They're always 30% more than anything else, and they have terrible customer service sometimes. You know, when you talk to the sales guy from a Swiss company, They'll, they'll size you up, you know. If I go to a big machine tool show, like every two years I go to IMTS in Chicago, all right, they look at me, they look at me in my shirt, all right, I look like we make auto parts or something like that. And sometimes these Swiss guys will be like, yeah, you can't afford it. Yeah, and that's it. Well, you know what? I went to the Willowman booth, and their machines are not cheap. 
And guess what? These dudes are like, yo, Bill, you came by our booth. Yo, man, check out our stuff. How about you make some of your stuff on our machines? And I'm like, yeah, right on. And I'm like, how much is that guy? And they told me I almost fell over. And I'm like, okay, all right. But guess what? I managed to get one, score one of these guys. It will make the most intricate, beautiful parts. And when I called up to talk about getting this guy in my shop and get their service guys out there, their service manager knew who exactly who I was. He's on ARFCOM. He actually moderates one of the biggest gun forums in Indiana and all their application guys, AR-15 guys, if you can believe it. And it's awesome. And I'm looking forward to this. And this Willman is going to give us capabilities that we don't even have now. So what do you think you guys want? Want to hear some suggestions? Yeah. Block trigger. All right. A lot of them you hit right on the head. Uh, complete rifles, bolt guns. Uh, 1911 was a big hit. Uh, a few people mentioned some enhanced bolt carriers. Um, there's a lot. There's a, there's there's a lot of here. Triggers and block triggers and slides. Uh, suppressors. Um, a high end precision uh, AK-47 trigger. Um, 2011s. Uh, Vepper triggers, which I actually. What's a 2011, Joe? Uh, double stack 1911. Ah, okay, okay. Great. Uh, AR-10s, CSAS clones, CSAS rails. Um, let me see. As in HK CSAS? That is as in HK CSAS. All right. Um, AR-10s, which I already touched on. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it is is is, is complete rifles. A okay. Complete rifles. Let's talk about the Glock trigger here. We've got some ideas for it. All right. I've never went into it because we've done a little bit of work with it, and it has to be absolutely perfect. I know the trigger feel that I want from this guy. Okay. I know what I want it to do. Um, we've got some ways to do it. And one thing that I don't like about a lot of the stuff out there, the aftermarket stuff is, you come right back, you get, they put a compromised striker spring in it. You know, why do that? All right. Yeah, it goes bang, but sometimes it doesn't. If you get dirt in it, it doesn't. It lowers your reliability, increases your lock time. It's all badness. Okay, why do you want to put this badness in your, in your pistol? So we get, if we're going to do a Glock trigger, it's got to use a full power hammer spring. We're not going to take the easy way out. All right. So we'll think about that this year. We've got some ideas, all right? For the CSAS rails, um, you know, HK1 with their awesome G28 rifle, and on this, we're making the rail. It's a work of art, okay? It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it takes a lot to make this guy. I actually have to buy a new horizontal, all right? Huge 600 millimeter horizontal, if you could believe that. If you guys are machining guys, you know what that is, all right, in order to do this rail. Um, we got the scope mount on it and a very cool bubble level. Awesome. Um, I don't have that thing released yet. I got a tool up for it. Again, my engineers outrun the production department. It's a matter of tooling. Okay, it's a very cool clamp on bubble level. Um, the bubble level, we went to an, a, a manufacturer of aircraft instruments. And they're the ones who made the bubble for this guy. And when we started showing them kind of what's out there on the market, <laughs> <laughs> they laughed. They're like, no, that's not how you do a level, man. And so they designed a level for this thing. It's totally cool. Um, we got just got a tool up for it. So that'll be out here. And I think you'll see some G28 rails coming in the spring. Okay. What was the other thing, Joe? Complete rifles, complete AR rifles. You know, something like this to sell. Maybe we'll get there very shortly. We'll see. Like I said, I want to do everything in-house because I control it. I don't like subbing stuff out. You know, a lot of gun manufacturers, they do very little in-house. It's all subcontract. And that's cool, man. That's their business model. That's how you do it. You don't want to own the equipment. You don't want to have, you know, employees who make because they're able to program and run this equipment. And a lot of companies don't want to do that. They do not want complicated five-axis machines in because you got to have a cracker jack to program and run it. Okay? You gotta have a cam system, which is how you program these things. You don't program these things line by line on a five axis, you need an involved cam system, which we have. Um, and you need to integrate this all with engineering, okay? Um, complete rifles, God willing, you'll see them soon, okay? What else, Joe?
Muzzle devices and suppressors. Um, you know, the Joy, the Joy suppressor works extremely well. I was very happy with it. Um, it has a very, very low shift, um, you know, Im impact shift from on to off, very repeatable, very small, and it works surprisingly well. It's also a pass-through suppressor, if you can believe that. Um, we've got it down pat, but it is not inexpensive to make, okay? It's not inexpensive. You know, when you do your design in the beginning, you're, again, remember, we did this in 60 days, and that suppressor wasn't designed. That was designed during the 60 days, and we have to make it. So it's involved to make, or it's made out of a solid chunk of titanium. Um, and it works. It works well. It doesn't erode. You know, a lot of titanium suppressors, you get a lot of sparks out of it. It erodes the baffles. I mean, that suppressor is light as can be. And it works extremely well. And when, God willing, when you guys get a chance to shoot Joy, I mean, the thing kicks like a kitten. All right? You get your scope on something, there's none of this wham. All right? It's just like... Abraham, my 11-year-old, I'm like, here, Abraham, shoot this sucker. We put him up on the bench, and he just started rocking on steel plates with it right off the bat. He's 11 years, he was 10 years old when that happened. That shows you what this gun is like, completely shootable. You watch your bullets splash out there. Um, I've got to change the fundamental things that we've developed with the suppressor. I've got to make it more manufacturable. Okay, remember, we're controlling the suppressor and rifle interface. And that's not controlled when you make a suppressor. You have to deal with everything that everybody else ha has out there. You know, threads that are not concentric to the bore, things like that. Um, so there's going to be some time before you see a Geisley suppressor. Um, I'm not going to even say we have plans for it, all right? Um, you know, we, we want to control everything right now. You might see that sometime. 1911, I'll tell you what. I've I've got some uh, I've got some good friends in the 1911 business, and we chat a little bit about it. And you might see that um, it's not going to be your typical 1911 that you see out there. Um, it's going to be something that if we do it, it's going to have improvements. It's going to take you take the 1911 and bring it up to the next level. Um, that's a possibility. Bolt carriers. All right, we have something out here called REK Reliability Enhancement Kit. Uh, it's our version of the AR-15 bolt carrier. Um, we've got some good solutions to this guy. One is nano weapon bolt carrier. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous. 82 Rockwell surface, um, cuts through sand. It's got some enhancements to it. Um, it doesn't have a, uh, a rough surface finish on the inside. Um, on the uh, uh, you know, it has a beautiful polished, smooth area where the gas. Um, rings ride. You know, a lot of people complain about their gas rings wearing out. Well, they wear out because it's got a rough surface finish on the inside. That's what you get these days with a bull carrier. All right, you look at the original military print from 1970. It says grind. Okay, you got to grind it. Well, the problem is that grinder to grind those three surfaces inside your bull carrier costs a half a million dollars. All right, back in the day, it was a little bit different. All right, they had. They had these automatic type Norton and Warner and Sweezy grinders, and it was a much more common tactic for them to grind because if you wanted anything that was remotely accurate, you had to grind it. You did not have this accuracy in your lathes and things like that. You weren't able to do it just by running a boring bar in there. Well, now these, you can, to some extent, run a boring bar in a bull carrier and get a half decent finish out. Problem is, on a microscopic level, it's got a phonograph finish, and this is what chews up your gas ring. All right, our bull carrier don't, doesn't have that. All right, got it. We've got a great extractor. It's made from a 13.8 like stainless, grows resistant, extremely tough. If you're a machinist, you know 13.8, and you know what that stuff is like. It is not the most friendly stuff to machine. It is extremely tough. It is extremely nasty. It's basically used on parts on naval aircraft in areas that are inaccessible to inspection, that's difficult to inspect, where you can't have corrosion cracks and things like that occur, like on control surfaces and things like that. Um, extremely difficult, but extremely tough, corrosion resistant material. That's our extractor, beautiful, all right? Got our own firing pin in this guy. We've got a cobalt cam pin. You've seen cam pin breakages. I'm trying to eliminate it with one of the strongest alloys out there. It's cobalt beautiful camp pin in this thing and the bolt 
Carpenter 158 plus. All right, this is an alloy from Carpenter. They made it for me. You can't buy this from them. All right, they cooked it for me. This is a special, extremely clean and refined Carpenter 158. We're undergoing, it's not ready yet, we're undergoing testing of this bolt because we want this bolt to exceed the lifespan of regular bolts out there. You know, the, the military is going to this MA55A1. It's a very high pressure round, very hard on bolts, um, but you can't change the geometry of the bolt, all right? That's a no-no. It has to be the exact same thing. So I believe that this steel is going to give us the edge in our special heat treatment process with this guy. We're working on it. Um, we've, got a, we've got a testing lab here, um, ultra high-end testing lab, and we're in process right now testing those bolts. Um, the nano weapon, you know, you've heard about this for a couple of years. Again, it's, it's not something that is like what everybody has and very doable. It's extremely difficult and we're still, after two years, we're still working the bugs out. God willing, we'll get there. You will see a bolt carrier reliability enhancement kit that'll absolutely, all right, kick butt. Um, it'll come, hopefully. Uppers and lowers. Maybe. All right. I'm running out of room in my shop. Okay. And that requires some big equipment to do that. If we do it, they'll be right. You'll get the Picatinny on top of the upper that's going to be straight, not crooked, like everything else out there that we find. Um, you'll get some quality uppers and lowers. All right. In DDC. But that requires more room. Ambi safety. Okay. Coming. Very close. All right. You might have seen our high speed selector. You notice I don't have it out here. That is a selector that the shooter can go from 45 to auto and then it'll flip back to semi-automatic without it staying in there. I truly believe our high-speed selector is the most important upgrade to the M4 carbine ever. Okay, And everybody who shoots it is totally into it. It is supercharging the M4 carbine. The problem is there's absolutely no civilian application for it because we don't have automatic rifles. And I'm very hesitant to let a lot of information, specifically technical information out there, because this is so important and it's going to give our warfighters such an edge. And if you ever get a chance to shoot it, you will agree with me. So you will not see it out on the table at SHOT Show. You won't see anything really on our website about it, no close-up pictures or anything like that. Strictly U.S. military. But from that safety, that has a requirement to be ambidextrous and have the levers flip back and forth and things like that. We're going to work on a version of this for the civilian market. It will come and it will be cool. The pullover. We'll, we'll get some of these on our website. They're cool. Land's End stuff. This is, an, this is a Mrs. ALG type thing. So, anything else, Joe? That's pretty much it. All right. Look, stop by our booth at SHOT Show. It's a great time. Free stuff, uh, free giveaways. When you come to the giveaway, our entire area around our booth is packed with people. It's a great time. All right. So if you're coming to SHOT Show, be safe. I'll see you in, in Las Vegas. And for everybody else, all my friends out there, you know, I just want to give you the thumbs up and wish you God's blessing in the new year. All right. Take care.